What happens, as I shared with the children, when someone repeatedly lies again and again and again? Well, lies, lies, and more lies are what we discover are being purported by the mainstream media. CNN is but one of those that is peddling lies as the purported news broadcast. And it's not just that they've abandoned the canons of journalism, which used to be that no self-respecting reporter would ever turn in a story unless he had two, at least two, trusted sources. Well, today, they've rejected that standard altogether, which, by the way, is a biblical standard based on the concept that in a courtroom, there had to be at least two witnesses, credible witnesses, for a capital punishment uh, crime uh, to be uh, to adjudicated. Well, they've rejected that, and now it's quite apparent they're making up stories that have no credibility and nothing in reality behind them at all. For example, the entire Trump-Russia narrative that has been spun ever since the election they d have done it, and they've admitted they have done it. Some of their reporters admitted they have done this simply to boost their ratings, knowing all along they were lying to the public. Well, many people say, well, so what? They told a lie, and, you know, what's the harm? Well, there's great harm done. Two superpowers were moving towards war because of these lies that were being told. They are promoting what many people have begun to call fake news. And that's not the only fake news that we see them. The uh, whole thing in Ferguson about hands up, don't shoot. We discovered that was fake news, and it had an impact. Riots around the country, police officers being shot. There was much more damage done by other examples of fake news that we have come to say, well, can CNN be trusted at all to ever tell the truth? Interesting, a Harvard study recently done on CNN has demonstrated that 93% of their cover coverage of the president, the current president, is negative. Is this objective journalism? All the while, the current president of CNN, Jeff Zucker, says that viewers trust his network, and these are his words, more than ever. <laughs> I guess he's creating his own fake news about their own crisis there at uh, CNN. But in the wake of that, it's not just the CNN scandal, which, by the way, they published news that was taken off the front page of the National Enquirer, <laughs> and they purported that this was real news when the National Enquirer actually admitted on page six that the front page was a fake news story, and evidently the CNN people didn't read the page six, but uh, they've been caught again and again, and they're, saying, they're kind of apologizing, saying, oh, we are taking this matter seriously. We're referring to our network's Standards and Practices Department. You have to wonder, has that been mothballed for 10 years or 20 years? Where's that standard and practices? And by the way, what standard are they following? Because a group called um, Project Veritas has done a little investigative reporting themselves, and they found that the CNN producer, John Bonifield, caught on hidden camera saying that he admitted the, the Russia Donald Trump narrative is mostly expletive deleted right now, and that we don't have any big giant proof. Next was a former Obama administrator that's one of the commentators for CNN, uh, the avowed communist Van Jones, confessing to an undercover uh, PV reporter that the Russia thing is a ju just a big fat nothing burger, and that the news network was covering it in order to make money and boost their ratings. They're admitting it that they're lying to the public. And needless to say, these revelations you would expect are going to cause them to change? Well, probably not. And uh, the sad thing to me is that it's not just CNN. It means the other major mainstream news networks knew that this was also a lie, the Trump-Russia collusion supposedly, and they were purporting and pushing the same set of lies that CNN was pushing as well. The Washington Post, the New York Times, USA Today, Chicago, on and on goes the mainstream media has been lying to the American public. And you have to wonder, when will the American public wake up and say, we don't trust them anymore? Like the little boy that cried wolf, they'll say, we hear them crying wolf 
in every headline. We won't trust anything they publish because they are liars and have proved themselves to be liars. But the problem in America goes much deeper than just lying journalists creating fake news everywhere. What about all the fake science that's paraded before the American public? What about the so-called global warming scare caused by man's activities on Earth? Perhaps you remember back in November of 2009 that there was a leak of over a thousand emails that revealed, this was from the University of East Anglia Climate Research Unit, it revealed that there was a complete corruption. The scientists were lying about the numbers and the temperature readings that they were putting in their data were complete fabrications, total lies in order for them to put forward an agenda that had nothing to do with science. They were not presenting science, they were presenting propaganda. And so what became known as Climate Gate used, uh, connected so closely with this term global warming that did you notice nobody talks about global warming anymore? The fake scientists have jettisoned global warming and now they talk about climate change. Well, just wait a minute. The climate changes, the weather changes all the time. An honest climatologist, when you can find one, will admit there were ice ages in the past and there were warming trends and the earth goes back and forth. It's all happening. Climate changes all the time, no matter what man does or does not do. But if you scratch the surface of this fake science, you'll find the real agenda is implementing a one-world government, that takes absolute control of every detail of every person's life. Whether you drive a car or walk or ride a bicycle, where you live, the kind of housing, how much space you have, what food you eat, every aspect of human life in a totalitarian dictatorial control, that's what the agenda really is in this so-called fake global uh, warming or, or climate uh, warming uh, that they're purporting. It's not the truth that they're about. It's a fake science. And that's not the only fake science going on. Consider what is presented as science in every classroom in America today. The myth of evolution. That's right. And most Americans believe evolution to be true even though it is not a scientific proposition at all. For if science were to deal with the areas that science can deal with, make a hypothesis, test that hypothesis repeatedly, 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 have uh, uh, pu conclusions published that are peer-reviewed by other scientists who are also testing the same hypothesis. And then your conclusion is a very humble conclusion as a scientist. You say, this is what we believe at this point in time to be the case, but wait 10 years, it might change. The honest scientist will admit that that is all that they are purporting. And so, therefore, nobody can tell what happened 10,000 years ago because no one was there and you cannot test for it and you cannot prove anything that has happened in the past. You can only test what is available right now. That's honest and true science. And so the whole thing about evolution is proposing something that happened in the past that nobody can prove or disprove according to the scientific method. And so in American classrooms, they're not only told these lies, they're given propaganda and the propaganda is presented as the truth. Consider this. In every science textbook, uh, evolution textbook, Ernest Haeckel's uh, presentation of recapitulation is given. He faked these diagrams to demonstrate what he believed and he wanted to propound that Every baby in a mother's womb goes through the entire history of human evolution in its formation at each stage of its development. So there was a fish stage and there's a reptilian stage and so on until you come to birth and then you're a human being. And he drew these diagrams claiming that these stages of the baby's development equal these stages of evolution. And that Heckel diagram has been shown to be a fraud. And in fact, he admitted it was a fraud, that he wanted to prove something it was what he claimed, and it's not the truth. And yet today, that is in the evolutionary textbooks, and it is taught to gullible children who trust their teachers. Talking with Neil about a friend of his family, 11-year-old, that he was explaining the Declaration of Independence to and said, see, it says here, we're created. We're created by our creator. And that 11-year-old turned to Uncle Neil and said, what? No, everybody knows that we evolved from 
monkeys. Everyone knows that. The idea that there is a creator was completely foreign because this child has been thoroughly indoctrinated with the lies of evolution in the classroom of America. When you think of all the lies that are being told in our land today, whether it's the media, whether it's scientists, whether whatever it is, the lies are everywhere. You have to wonder why anybody believes anything at all. How can you know when you open the newspaper that anything there is true? When you turn on the TV and the news, if that's true, when you go to a science tech, how do you know that anything is true? Like the little boy that cried wolf, if you cry wolf too many times, no one ultimately believes. We live in a world that is awash in lies. In fact, I think the image of the matrix is pretty accurate. There's a whole bunch of people believing the lies and they're taking the blue pill on a daily basis and there's only a few who discover, wait a minute, this whole thing is a lie. It is all interconnected lies, but I've got to step out of that. How do you do that? Take your Bible, if you would, and turn to Titus chapter 3 and verse 8. For there is in this world that is a wash in lies, there is a trustworthy source. There is a source of truth. Titus chapter 3, and we'll pick up the account at verse 8. The apostle inspired by God writing to his disciple Titus says, This is a faithful saying. In contrast to all the lies, this is a faithful saying, and these are things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Notice what the Apostle Paul is saying here. When he says this, he's referring to everything that's come before. That is chapter 1 of Titus, and chapter 2, and the first seven verses of chapter 3. This, the Word of God, is faithful. The Word of God is faithful in every way. That word translated here into our English faithful is the Greek word pistos. It means trustworthy. It means faithful. It first refers to in the definition of a person who has shown themselves faithful in the transactions of life, in the transactions in a business exchange or uh, in the execution of commands that they are given or in discharging official duties that they have a faithful, a trustworthy person. The second meaning speaks of one who has kept their pledged faith. That is, they've made a promise and they fulfill the promise they made. They are faithful. They are worthy. They are trustworthy. The third meaning has to do with uh, the idea that as uh, we can be a person that can be relied upon, a person that can be counted upon to do as they should. And the God whom we worship is all of this and more. He is faithful. He is trustworthy. And therefore, his word, his communication to us as human beings is faithful. It is trustworthy. Keep your finger there in Titus for a moment. If you turn to Numbers in the Old Testament, the book of Numbers, chapter 23 and verse 19 makes this abundantly clear that God is one who keeps every promise that he makes. Numbers 23 and in particular, verse 19, Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the Son of Man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Every promise that God has ever made, he either has fulfilled or he is going to fulfill. He made promises to Adam and Eve in the Garden of God. Uh, uh, in the Garden of Eden when they fell into sin, a promise that was fulfilled by Jesus Christ on the cross. Many multiple prophecies, more than 300 prophecies about Jesus' life when he was here in his first advent have been fulfilled. God makes promises and he is faithful because he keeps every promise that he's made. If you're there in Numbers, if you turn to Psalm 146, because we need to understand, this is Psalm 146, that truth is the essence of God's very character. He is faithful and true because truth is part of his very being, part of his very nature. This is Psalm 146 beginning at uh, verse 5. Psalm 146 and verse 5 says, Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, his help, excuse me, 
whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever. The God whom we worship is one who keeps truth forever because truth is an essential part of his very nature, of his character. He is truth. In fact, our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, I'll just quote it for you in, in John 14, verse 6, said, I am, referring to himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So God's very character, his very nature is one of truth, and therefore anything God says, anything he gives to us, his word, is absolute truth. It is promises that will be fulfilled. We live in a day where lying is all too common. And lying has become, you know, blasé. People are not surprised when they hear lies because they have come to expect to hear lies. But as Christians, when we look at the Word of God, we know really, as we look at, you know, what science claims and what other, other things claim, only the Word of God gives us absolute, unchanging truth. It is the absolute truth. It is the faithful Word. And so what Paul's exhortation to uh, Titus is there in, in Titus 3.8, is that he would affirm constantly, that he would remind the disciples that he was working with there on the island of Crete, that he'd remind them of these facts, that the Word of God is faithful, the Word of God is true because God is absolutely true and God is faithful. His Word is fixed. His Word is the unchanging truth. Now we might look and say, well, that's a nice charge that Paul gave to Titus, but what about us? We have the same charge as well. We ought to be reminding one another as disciples of Jesus Christ that we're living in a world where it's hard to know where the truth is and what people are communicating to us, whether it's true or a lie, but we have absolute truth here in the Word of God. It alone is trustworthy, and everything that the Word of God says in every, deal is, every detail is absolutely true. When we go to a museum as a family, I often remind my girls such that now they say it on their own. When they see the placard that says, you know, the earth is millions and millions and hundreds of millions of years old, that placard is lying. The Word of God tells us the earth is about 6,000 years old, that God created it, and the whole theory of evolution and the Big Bang, all of these things are going to be, you're going to see them in museums, but they are not true. They are lies the Word of God gives us the truth. And so-called scientists will uh, propound all kinds of theories about what happened in the past, but they weren't there. They weren't eyewitnesses of creation. There was only one eyewitness. It was God himself. And so why don't we trust the eyewitness to those events and what he said took place rather than what scientists theorized took place uh, in, in uh, past issues where they have no absolute uh, uh, availability of the information. For example, there's no way that anyone can test and prove the age of the earth. They have all kinds of theories about carbon dating, but if you look at those closely, you'll find that those theories contradict each other. And a rock that uh, just came out of the volcano at Mount St. Helens, they said, was 10,000 years old, quite obviously. Their theory about the aging of, of uh, carbon dating does not work uh, at all. The Word of God is faithful in everything it says. It's a fascinating study to me of what's happened to those who attempted to debunk the Bible and say, we found an error. We found a historical inaccuracy in the Bible. For example, the whole Hittite civilization referred to again and again in the Old Testament. There were many for hundreds of years that said, that's a fable. There never was a Hittite civilization. It was made up by the people who wrote the Bible that wanted to invent something that, did, that never exist. And lo and behold, in the middle of Turkey, one day an archaeologist put his shovel in and clink, he hit something, and he dug up the Hittite civilization. Uh, before unknown, except in the Bible, completely unknown, a lost civilization that the Bible referred to and the archaeologist stumbled upon. Likewise with Nineveh, a vast city, a vast empire, the, the Scripture describes it as. And yet, for years, many people believed that the Bible was just making up a story about a, a civilization that never existed. Until again, the shovel went into the earth in the Middle East and clink, they discovered this huge city of Nineveh, a ruins, but it was an enormous city. Again, the, uh, those who doubted the Bible had egg on their face. Many other uh, examples could be cited. King Hezekiah, 
Again, all the kings of the Old Testament, many of them are questioned by historians like, wow, the Bible says this guy Hezekiah reigned and so until the archaeologists discovered things with the name Hezekiah in them. And they discovered, oh, I guess the Bible's true because we found these archaeological evidences. I'd prefer to trust the Bible than archaeologists who have yet to discover what the Bible clearly states. And Paul's instructing Titus and us as well to be encouraging one another to realize that the Word of God is trustworthy. It is faithful. This is a faithful saying. These things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. And so as disciples of Jesus Christ here, Paul is describing us as those who have believed in God. Now take that phrase, believe in God, and it can mean many different things. Those worshipers of the moon idol, they claim they believe in God. There's, you know, a, a Hindu who claims that there are 300 million God. He says he believes in God and so on and so forth. So what does the Bible mean when it says to believe in God? Well, from the context here in Titus 3, it's very clear the God that Paul is referring to is the triune God of the Bible. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Not something else, only that God. And Scripture actually tells us what it means to believe. The definition is given in Hebrews 11.1 1 of faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That word substance is a fascinating term because it refers to, in their literature, in their context, of a title deed to property. Talk about something that's substantial. The title deed says you own this piece of property. Here's the boundaries of this property, and this title deed is the ownership of that, indicating the ownership of that property. And we have this title deed to faith, and it is based upon what God has revealed to us in His Word. So, we believe what the Bible says about each and every thing. For example, if you believe in God, as, as uh, Titus is uh, being exhorted here to consider, if you believe in God, you believe the facts that God's Word teaches us about who God is, the facts about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We hold these essential facts as true, and we believe them. A good summary of those facts you could find in the Nicene Creed. There are some other creeds, but the Nicene Creed, I like it because it, it does a very thorough job of covering all the essentials. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things, both visible and invisible, in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, both in heaven and on earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost and of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. From thence he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets in one holy Catholic, that's small c, meaning universal, in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of of the world to come. Amen. A good summary of what the biblical doctrine teaches on the essentials. There's much more in Scripture, but we, to believe in God, means to believe those essentials. I was talking with someone who said they, they were Christian. I said, oh, that's, that's wonderful. So do you believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, that Christ is fully God? No. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? No. It's like, well, I, I'm confused about your definition of Christian. What, you know, it's like, well, I believe I'm a Christian regardless of, it's like, I'm sorry, you know, you might want to define yourself as something that uh, Scripture says you're not, but you believe the essentials of the Christian faith. That's what it means to believe in God. But believing in God is not just a set of facts that we assent to and say, I, I, I acknowledge that these things are true. It involves us personally placing our full trust entirely in Jesus Christ. And that means we ultimately say, I believe the entirety of the Bible, even if I don't understand it all yet, 
I'm studying it and, and learning it, but I believe it even if I don't com comprehend it. We place our trust today in many things that we don't understand, that we uh, completely don't have a grasp upon. Remember years ago when I flew a commercial airline for the first time, I had a window seat right over the wing of the airplane. And, uh, you know, I had theories in my mind about how this thing that's this heavy with all these people and all their baggage is going to stay up in the air. But it, it had the idea that that wing is solid and it doesn't move. And so as we bounce down the runway, I see the wing going like this. It's like, is that thing actually going to keep us in the air? <laughs> well, I learned from that first flight and many subsequent flights, yeah, the, the thing actually does keep you in the air and actually does successfully reach the destination and safely land, all those kind of things. And I got to thinking about it. How many people are involved in building that air aircraft? There's thousands of employees putting hundreds of thousands of parts together and 36 miles of wiring and cables and all kinds of things that they're assembling, but they're depending on their actions on the assembly line with engineers who are behind the scenes making all these plans and giving them specific instructions about how each nut is to be secured and the rivets and all the details of putting this massive plane together. So, for example, the 737, the basic fuselage is built in uh, Wichita, Kansas by a whole set of employees there, and then they put it on a train and train it 2,000 miles away over to Renton, Washington, and a whole other set of employees there are putting the details on the inside, putting the wings on and the engine and all the things that can enable this uh, machine to fly. But what happens if one of those employees makes a mistake? doesn't follow the directions the engineers have given them? Or what happens if the engineers make a mistake in their calculations and they give wrong instructions to those actually assembling that aircraft? And uh, we trust that there's inspectors and there's those who are going to test every detail of this plane before it actually goes out. And, and so we trust that entire process of thousands of employees at Boeing, in that case, to make that happen. And it's not just those employees of Boeing because they've outsourced many of the things that they put into their aircraft. And so there's employees of many American companies producing parts. And we have to trust that those employees also did their job correctly and, and was, was tested and checked correctly. And, and it's not just even American employees. They uh, have components coming from China and Korean uh, aerospace industries and ailerons from Malaysia and landing gear from Taiwan and uh, uh, then all sorts of parts from Japan. We've never met these people. We've never investigated if, if they're faithful employees. Do they really do what they're supposed to do? But we trust they've done all this and they put this all together and this thing is actually going to get us in the air safely and then back on the ground safely in, in something that otherwise, why would we trust it? You see, we trust many things in our world today we don't fully understand. Why then wouldn't we trust the sovereign God, the creator of the universe, who gave us his word? See, I'm always amazed that people say, well, I, I don't know. The Bible, you know, I don't know that I can trust it because after all, it was all these thousands of years being put together and there was many different authors involved. And, you know, and then we had to have it transmitted from those original authors and it's come down. How can we trust that whole process? Well, is your God big or is your God small? If your God's big, of course he could do that. He could preserve his word faithfully from when it was originally uh, transmitted to those who wrote it and transmit it on down to us. Of course he can. Our sovereign God, the Lord of the universe, what it means to believe in him is to trust in him. And of course, if we trust God, then we're going to trust that what he commands us to do is what is best for us. Uh, you see, belief in God literally means repentance of our sins. And it will reveal itself in a transformed life that turns from sin uh, to walk in righteousness. You see, if we hold what the Bible and believe what the Bible says about sin, we recognize that sin is a violation of the commands of God, a rebellion against the law that he has laid down for us, that we'll repent of that rebellion and we'll turn from our wicked ways to walk in the paths of righteousness. In a sense, the Bible is like the owner's manual for human beings. If you've ever purchased a car, you, usually that car comes with an owner's manual. And if you're a wise driver, you read the owner's manual. You understand what's required to keep that car running. And, you know, if it's a gasoline car, it very clearly instructs you, don't put diesel in the gas tank. Because if you put diesel in the gas tank, you're going to have a huge problem. You probably have to replace the engine. It's going to be a disaster. And if you 
trust your owner's manual, you don't put diesel in the gas tank. But if you think, you know, those, those guys, they don't know what they're talking about. I, I'm going I, to do this anyway. And you do it. Then you discover, sadly, that you have a huge repair on your hand. And so to disobey the commandments of God is like putting diesel in our human gas tank. It has great, grave consequences. In fact, the Word of God says the wages of sin is what? Death. This is extremely serious. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so Paul is instructing Titus to instruct the congregations, the disciples in Christ that he's working with, to move forward in their faith, in their trust of God. And if they do, then they will do the next thing. Going back to Titus 3.8, this is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God, and here's the application, might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. And so a believer in Jesus Christ here is commanded to maintain good works. Notice it says careful to maintain good works. It tells us there's a danger that we must be on guard against in our life of forgetting a ministry of good works, of kind of setting that aside. That's a temptation. That's a tendency on our part. But the Christian life, if we're truly following Jesus Christ as what we, as his disciples, if we're following the, the life of Christ, then we are doing what he did, and he did good works. Let me read to you from Acts 10, uh, verses 36 and following. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And notice how it describes the ministry of Jesus, who went about doing good, and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So as followers of Jesus Christ, that's what we are to follow. We are to go about doing good and healing those who are oppressed of the devil. And by the way, how many does that include that are oppressed of the devil? The whole world, you know? It's only when we come to faith in Christ that we're released from that oppression of the devil. So the ministry of leading people to faith in Christ is that ministry of healing those that are oppressed of the devil. This is what we are called upon to do, to do good works. I printed there in your bulletin Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, which is one of the multiple commands in Scripture about doing good works. It says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are, are of the household of faith. And so there's a wide variety of activities we might talk about in terms of doing good to our fellow Christians and doing good to those who are not believers that are, are about us. And it, a definition of good works might be simply what Jesus commanded in Luke 6.31, as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. The golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's doing good. It's basically a fulfillment of the second greatest commandment. Remember, the first is to love your Lord, Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. So doing good works is essentially loving our neighbor as ourselves. Do you know that as a believer in Jesus Christ, you are an ambassador for the kingdom of God? That is, you're a representative here in this world that people, when they see you, they ought to see a representative of the kingdom of God. That is a living illustration of what a disciple of Jesus Christ is all about. And in a sense, good works are a broadcast to everywhere, everywhere we go that this is what a disciple of Jesus Christ looks like. This is what a disciple of Jesus Christ does. I was thinking of a driving school advertisement I, I saw recently. I read about one company that used a bright, shiny, brand new red Mustang for their driving education. You might wonder, wow, I mean, that car going to get scratched and wrecked? But anyway, uh, and it had two signs on the back, on the back window. The first sign was the name of the driving academy with its phone number, very clearly, the uh, telephone number. The second sign only had three words, drive this Mustang. Now, you can imagine somebody driving down the street, and there's two cars, one for your traditional driving academy, kind of a nondescript car that, you know, is not very attractive and 
you know, and that car said, drive this car, and then the red Mustang over here, drive this car. Which one are you going to choose? So that car itself was a, a moving advertisement for that academy, for that driving academy. Because when people saw it, they not only saw the information, okay, here's the name of the driving academy, here's the phone number if I want to uh, connect with that, that company and uh, uh, take their services, but also, I want to drive that car. I'm going to go to that academy because I'd rather drive that car than this, whatever, this Yugo or something over here. So uh, we are that. You see, we are living, breathing advertisements, ambassadors for Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And so in the same way, our good work speaks volumes. Yes, we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's kind of like the, the part of the ad that, that just gives the phone number. Here's how you can come to faith in Christ. But until they see the car, in a sense, and say, wow, that's what I want. You see, if we live the Christian life as a disciple of Christ, if we live a life that is above the rest of humanity, if we truly love our neighbor as ourselves, some will see that and say, if that's what the Christian life is, I want that. I want to live like that person is living. If the words are just presented, the gospel, without the life, oftentimes a person says, well, what difference does that make? I don't see a living example before me of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And so good works are called upon us to be actively doing in many, many ways in, in, in this world. But I think we need to un expand our understanding of what the Scripture talks about regarding good works because I think in some respects we kind of limit good works to a certain area. Good works actually encompass everything God's Word commands of us. Turn, if you would, to, um, uh, to Isaiah Wait a minute. Before we go to Isaiah, sorry. Uh, let's expand our understanding by going to Proverbs 24. Sorry about that. Proverbs 24, verses 11 and 12. Proverbs 24, 11 and 12. There are many things that we're commanded to do that are good works, but some who are blinded by the devil, when we do those good works, will not respond positively. That is, they'll see the Mustang there and they'll say, I don't want that. So we've got to realize that Doing good works is not always going to earn us an accolade from the world. The world may see us do a good work and they, they reject it. But it, it's a good work if it's defined by God's word as a good work. Look at Proverbs 24, uh, verses 11 and 12. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? So here's a good work that God is calling upon us to defend those who are being drawn to death, those who are about to be slaughtered. I remember years ago when I became aware that in Severna Park on Ritchie Highway was a murder facility. I'd driven by that location for many, many years, and I'd never been aware that in that building, they were killing babies. But I have to say to my own shame that initially when I heard this news, I did nothing about it. It wasn't until 9-11 took place, and I was convinced that God was giving us a wake-up call as a country, calling us to repentance for our many, many sins, and that one of those sins was the sin of abortion. While I couldn't certainly stop abortion everywhere, I could do something about the murder of the babies that were taking place in my own community. And so I joined with some others and some from our church and some from some other congregation and we began to protest outside that murder mill. We aimed to make the community aware, which I hadn't been until recently, that murders taking place in that building on a daily basis, murder of babies is happening. And we showed pictures of what is a horrific evil, what it looks like. And it's not pleasant to see, I admit that. We received curses for our work. We received objects thrown at us, cars attempting to run us down, and uh, death threats for doing that work in Severna Park. And the large church across the street from that murder center at one point called me on the carpet demanding that I end the protests there across the street from the church. Oddly, I found out a co-owner of the building was a member of that church which means he was receiving blood money. And maybe some of that blood money was actually going in the offering 
plate. You know, we persisted for a year. It was not easy. It was not pleasant. We persisted for a year and we saw the victory that the owner finally ended the lease of the abortionist in his building and that murderer had to move elsewhere. Subsequently, that murderer was convicted of killing a woman, not just babies, but killing a woman, and his license was pulled and so he no longer murders in Anne Arundel County. And by God's providence, a pregnancy clinic was set up in that very same footprint where the murders were taking place. And I had the privilege of being there for the opening ceremonies of, uh, and dedication of that pregnancy clinic. And uh, during that ceremony, one of the things that we were privileged to do is write scripture on the walls where the room was going to be painted. We got a pen and, and wrote scripture in the very room, the murder chamber where the babies were murdered. And on the floor in the center of that room is still the blood stain, the blood of thousands, and I don't know how many thousands of babies that were murdered right there in our community, right in Severna Park. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and uh, those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? You see, doing good at times can involve things that are not pleasant, things that don't earn you any accolades from the community, are not even viewed as good works on the part of the community, but they are good because they are what God commands us to do. Doing good is loving my neighbor, even my neighbor that's in his or her mother's womb. You know, as dangerous as the streets of Baltimore are where there's a murder a day on average, by far the most dangerous address in America today is the womb of a mother. Sixty million slaughtered since 1973. And even those surgical abortions, a couple percentages lower than they were a few years ago, a couple points down, nonetheless the use of abortifacients today are on the rise. These are chemicals, drugs taken that destroy the life of the baby, creating either a hostile environment uh, in, in the uterus or uh, preventing the baby from actually attaching after it is fertilized. It is a human being from the moment it is fertilized. And anything done to end that baby's life is murder. And this is a good work that God calls us to in this day. Turn now, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1, which regards another whole area that I think commonly Christians don't think of as good works. Isaiah chapter 1 and verses 16 and 17. The prophet Isaiah speaking to the people of Israel says, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well. Notice what he then goes on to define doing well, doing good work. Here it is, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. So here, a good work involves coming alongside to aid someone who is being oppressed, someone who either individual is oppressing them or even a system is oppressing them, seeking to help those who are being abused by the powerful, that uh, those whose God-given rights are being trampled upon by the mighty. And that may ultimately involve not just a personal interaction. Turn over to chapter 10 of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 10, and look at verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 10, verses 1 and 2. Woe unto those that decree unrighteous decrees, that write grievousness, which they have prescribed, to turn aside the needy from judgment and to take away the right from the poor of my people that widows may be their prey and they may rob the fatherless. Here it's talking about on a level of civil government. Those who write the decrees, those who make the judgments in court, those who oppress from civil government's uh, power, oppress those and, and uh, destroy those. It is the God-given rights that's, that are being protected are being attacked. And so Scripture is calling us to eliminate every form of these oppressions as a good work. I like what Frederick Bastiat calls in his little work, The Law, legalized plunder. That is when the civil government gets involved in violating God's law, plundering one set of people, stealing from them in order to give it to another set of people. 
Now, there are abundant examples today in our land of exactly what is decried here in Isaiah chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, of decreeing unrighteous decrees. You might call them legislation, but they're unrighteous decrees. That right grievousness, which they have prescribed, kind of sounds like opinions of the court. Grievousness is what they're writing. So there's legislative bodies oppressing people. There's executive branches oppressing, as well as judges decreeing unrighteousness in our land. For example, you may not have heard about what happened in Kentucky this week. This Friday, Samuel Gerard, an Amish farmer, was convicted. He'd been convicted. He was sentenced. He was convicted back in March of doing the horrible thing of selling herbal health products that didn't have the labeling the FDA requires on health products. According to the government, this Amish man broke the law, growing and processing and bringing to market his own herbal supplements without FDA approval. And so this Friday, Judge Reeves, in the sentencing of Gerard, sentenced him to six years in prison. Six years in prison. Because he didn't follow the FDA. Which, by the way, if you understand our Constitution, the FDA is completely illegal. We, the people, never gave the federal government any power to make the decisions that the FDA makes on a daily basis. So a criminal organization arrested this man and imprisoned him for six years. Judge Reeves sentencing said, sentenced him, and then uh, the, uh, there was a group outside, our friend... Uh, uh, Richard, Sheriff Richard Mack was outside with a group of those who were protesting this, and he said, this day they have created a felon out of a good law-abiding citizen, which is what this Amishman was and is and still is in spite of the court's ruling. In fact, it's, it's interesting to see that uh, this is what the Amishman said back to the court. I am not a creature of the state or government. As such, I am not within your jurisdiction. I do not waive my immunity to this court, he told the judge. And then he said, I do not consent to anything the judge was demanding. And he emphasized that the fact that according to his faith, he doesn't recognize the authority of that court, and he told the court so, he only recognizes the authority of God. We're called to defend those who are unjustly treated by our government. So good works includes these things, things that I think many Christians would not categorize as good works. We ought to do all of them, not to do one and leave the other undone. We ought to do all that our Lord calls upon us to do as His disciples, as those who are building His uh, kingdom in this world. And as we do good works, the blessing will come back to us, sometimes in unexpected ways. There's a legend of a king who years ago had a son that was drowned in the river as he was uh, swimming. And he offered a large reward to anybody that could find his son's body and return it to him. After seven days, one man discovered that the boy actually had not died, but he was holed up in a cave where the river was going by the cave and he couldn't escape from it on his own. So the boy was brought back to uh, the king. And the king, when he learned that the boy was saved from starvation by bread, that floated down the river that he was able to capture and eat. And on each loaf of bread, the baker's imprimatur was stamped so that you knew who baked that, that loaf of bread. And so the king summoned the baker and asked him, what in the world induced him to throw his bread in the river? Why would you do something like that? The baker replied, I was reading Ecclesiastes, and I came to chapter 11, verse 1, which says, cast thy bread upon the waters for thou shalt find it after many days. And so I decided to try the proverb and see if it worked. <laughs> and the king rewarded him, uh, making him mayor of five villages that were near the capital. He received the reward of showing his generosity. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto